Good morning. Scripture today is Mark 7, verses 24 to 30. Page 40 in the New Testament. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the child's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. God's word for the people of God. Thank you, Jack. Jack and I had conversation. Jack, Jack has been thrilled with that scripture passage all week, getting ready for it, and talked to me about it. He even researched it to see what, what does this mean. And so I, I, I don't know if I'll do you justice or not, Jack, but I'll give this a shot. Um, that, um, that picture that I showed you of Pamper, a um, little backstory to that. Uh, in September, my dad's birthday is in September, just a few days from now. Um, my mother, who was seven months pregnant with me, uh, presented my dad with this little border collie pup for his birthday. And they named her Pamper. And so Pamper was there in the household when I was born in November. And Pamper, she's a little border collie, and border collies, if you know anything about border collies, they take care of things. And so I was the one that Pamper decided needed care. And Pamper parked herself under my crib every night, slept under my crib, and was with me when I learned how to crawl. Pamper was there. Was with me when I learned how to walk. Pamper was there. When I was tearing around the house as a young child before school, Pamper was there. Pamper was my first buddy. Dad thought Pamper was his dog. I No, Dad, uh, uh Dad was gone to work all day. I was with Pamper all the time, 24-7. When I grew up to the age where I had to go to school, I would leave home. Pamper would be right at the door as I'm going out the door. And when I came home at 3 in the afternoon, Pamper was on the front stoop of our house waiting for me. Now, I, got, I ended up with three younger brothers, and yeah, the younger brothers liked to play the pamper and so forth, but the reality was pamper was my dog. When we got home from school, although the f number of us would be together, pamper would come right to me. I was pamper's boy, and pamper took, took good care of me, and we had a relationship that I could tear up now talking about it. It's been so long. 
And so in 1969, when Pamper died, it was traumatic in my life. And I remember in those days, in those days when your pets got sick, vets just basically told folks, <laughs> got to put your pet away. I mean, they didn't do anything else. I mean, they're, they don't do what they do with pets now. And so we knew it was coming. Dad said that night before he was going to take Pamper to the vet, say goodbye to Pamper. And I sat next to Pamper and cried and talked to Pamper. And the next morning, woke up early before school and sat there with Pamper and said goodbye and went to school and came home. And Mom told me it was over. And it was the emptiest feeling of my life at that point in my life. It was one of the toughest days I can remember. And it's strange how Pamper and I could communicate with each other. In fact, the lasting gift that Pamper gave to me was I, was, I became fluent in dog. <laughs> we knew each other, so we grew up together. I, I, this dog knew me and I knew this dog and there wasn't a whole lot of explanation that was needed. It was, it was real, it was a real relationship. It was a, there was a, some kind of spiritual connection there that really nobody else in the family had. Dad was closest, but, but I had it because I grew up with this, with this dog and we were close. You know, it's strange that as I became an adult, I never had another pet because, and maybe it's because the connection with Pamper was so good and we did get another pet a couple years later. It was, her name was Lady and she was an English Springer Spaniel, but you know, Pamper was my standard and Lady was the dumbest dog I ever met. So maybe I never got a pet because I didn't think anybody ever measured up, measure up to, to Pamper. And, and But you know, the gift that I got from Pamper was I can connect with just about any dog out there to this day. Someone else's dog, I could steal your dog because we get along so well. Um, I can connect, when Sammy comes to the church, Sammy Leisure, when Sammy comes to the church, I can connect with Sammy, and Sammy, you know, I, I, love, I love Sammy, and Sammy's our church dog. Um, and, um, and I've always had that knack. I, I can connect with any dog that I come into contact with, and I think it's because of that beginning I had with my pet, Pamper, my buddy, my partner, Pamper. And that's why today in Mark's lesson, I can connect with that woman, that Gentile, that Syrophoenician woman who gives that smart answer to Jesus. Yeah, but they even feed the dogs under the table, you know. I remember Pamper used to be under the table, and we would feed Pamper under the table. It was usually my dad or myself because she'd come to us and I would always give her something and it wasn't forbidden in my house to feed Pamper under the table because she was part of the family and even though she couldn't sit upright in a chair at the table, she was part of it. Now came a time when dad would tell her to go lay down in the corner and she would, but not, not before she got fed by a couple of us along the way. Pamper was part of the family and although she was under the table, she was still part of the family. She was still part of the supper time tradition of our house. And we, we counted her just dad, mom, the four boys, and pamper. We were all together. And so as I'm reading this lesson from Mark, the first thing that I'm thinking of is pamper under the table and how meaningful and important that was and how special she was to our family life. And not being able to sit in the chair was no reason to exclude her. Now, this gospel story shows up in both Mark and Matthew, and they are very, very different. And with just a few sentences, I'll show you the difference. Go ahead, put it up. In today's lesson on the, on the left-hand column from Mark, Here's the, here's the blow by blow. Jesus goes to the Gentile region in Israel called Tyre, and, um, and he goes because he did not want to be noticed. All right, Mark's making it clear that Jesus is going to a place where he hopes he can be anonymous, 
to rest from the crush of the crowds that are out in Galilee in the areas where they know who he is and they don't leave him alone. So Jesus went not to be noticed. Mark makes a point of saying that. And even there, even in Gentile land, what we find out from Mark is he goes noticed even there. A woman, a Gentile woman, recognizes him and immediately goes to him with her need. And her need was her daughter was suffering. And it said a demon. We don't quite know what it was very often. Uh, a, a, an emotional illness or epilepsy or something like that was described as a demon because people didn't have medical knowledge and that's how they described it in those days. So she was suffering from something severe and she was looking for help for her daughter. And she begged Jesus. She went up to Jesus. She begged him, it, Mark says. Even though he was trying to be off by himself, a rabbi sort of on sabbatical from all the pressures and tensions that he was facing elsewhere in Israel. She begged him, and he gave this abrupt answer, this, this answer that just sounds really out of character for Jesus. He said it's not fair to give children's food to the dogs. And the children, the implication here, that's all he says, but the implication is he's a rabbi, and when he says about, when he talks about the children, he's talking about the children of God, which means the Israelites, and he's in Gentile land. So when he says it's not fair to give the, the children's food to the dogs, he's talking about his, his ministry with the Israelites, and now he's in Gentile land, and there's no expectation that he has a ministry there. And she comes right back. It's a great answer. She's just... She's thinking. She said that even the dogs under the table get fed. And it's like, wow. First of all, can you imagine a woman addressing a rabbi like that and then coming back with such a kind of a caustic response? And Mark makes it very clear that Jesus announced that her daughter was well for no other reason than because she won the argument. Now, let's look at Matthew. Matthew takes it in a different direction. Jesus goes to Tyre, the Gentile land. The woman approaches, like in the last story. Um, I'm sorry, it's not the Gentiles. That's a typo on my part. The disciples, now the disciples are in Matthew's story. The disciples tell Jesus to send her away. The disciples didn't want her around. Jesus tells her he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. This is where Jesus is very explicit about that. He says she was sent to, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, and it's not fair to take the food from the children for the dogs. And then she makes her famous response. And then Jesus tells her that her faith is great and her request is granted. It's only in Matthew that the matter of faith comes up in the story. The matter of faith does not come up in the Gospel of Mark. So what are the differences then? Well, clearly what Matthew is doing is theological. That's his intention. He's trying to make an important theological statement about who Jesus is in the presence of Gentiles who have the same need as anybody else. And basically the point that Matthew wants to make is faith gets you to heaven, not your pedigree. That means Gentiles are as worthy of getting into heaven as are the Israelite children for whom he is a rabbi. And so there's a, Matthew wants to give a real theological inclusivity here that is really kind of a study in the differences between the children of God, the Israelites, and all other people who don't fall in that category. And Jesus is making it clear, categories don't get you into heaven. It's about faith. Now, the point that Mark is attempting to make is that all God's children are worthy, are worthy in this life and worthy in the next. And Jesus is just not playing along by using the line that he used. Jesus really wanted to be alone. 
Remember, Jesus was as human as he was divine, and he had human feelings just like us, and he went to the Gentile country because he was overrun and pressured and had tension, and he needed to relax. He needed to get away from all of that. And so Jesus goes there, and he really did want to be alone, and now he's being bothered again, okay? And you're going to have a human reaction to that. And so Jesus wasn't playing along. He was saying... He was saying what his role was. He was a rabbi, and he said what a rabbi's role is in Israel, and it's not to the Gentiles. But the woman shook him with her comment. She shook him out of his rabbi mode, and she shook him back into his human being mode. And Jesus knew a better argument when he saw it. We know what it's like to be bested by someone in a conversation, in a debate, in an argument. You all know what it's like to be bested by someone? And we got one of two things we do when we're bested by someone in an argument. We either keep fighting back even though we have no ground to stand on now because we've just been beaten, or we acknowledge that that person had a better point, and I accept that. Those, those, those are the responses we have to a moment like that. I want to share with you a quote from a New Testament professor at Boston College about today's passage. Dr. Femi Perkins, and she says this, This passage reminds pastors, teachers, and others in positions of authority how to lose an argument. I love that line. We need to learn that, all of us because we're all in that position sooner or later in our lives, and we need to learn how to lose an argument. And Jesus shows us how to do that. Many of us do not have nearly so much graciousness, meaning as Jesus. Even though we know that the other person is right, we may try to justify ourselves rather than agree and get with the business at hand. It was not easy for a Gentile woman to approach a Jewish teacher for help. Yet her love for her child had brought her across boundaries of gender, religion, and ethnic origins. And the poetry to all of it is the Jesus who healed her child would never turn away those who seek help. Thank you. So I would say that the point of Mark's passage compared to Matthew's version, is not as high and lofty as pointing to heavenly realities. And yet it's just as important for us in our earthly living. In Mark, Jesus, through his own example, is teaching us how to be decent human beings in a world where that can often be an incredibly hard thing. And in a society that seems to be coming more and more divisive as time goes on, this is a vitally important lesson for all of us to take heart and to seek to live out in the best ways we possibly can. Like I said, we can all think of times when we or someone else was in a position of arguing and losing. And what does it mean for us to be gracious in the losing? Think about this for a minute, along with being in debates. Think of a time in your life, and it can be in just about any category, any way that any, any situation in your life can apply if you think about it. Think about moments in your life when you've had to play out some kind of official role, an official role. It can be the official role of a parent. It can be the official role of an employer. It can be an official role that of anybody who has power over someone else and has to represent that institution or that sense of power. And so you've got certain lines that you know. You know how you're supposed to deal with this. You might be a manager. You might be this or that. And you know what it means to play that official role. 
But also think of the times when you're called upon to just be a person, regardless of your role, who simply acts as a result of heart of compassion. Now, think about a situation where you're in, where both situations are at play. You're an official role, but you're also called upon to have a heart of compassion. And ask yourself, by and large in my life, when I am presented with these two roles and I've got to choose one, which one do I usually pick? And you know what? When you're dealing with that reality, guess where you are? You're with Jesus in the presence of that Gentile woman. You're with Jesus because that's the same thing he had to do. Weigh out his role as a rabbi and roll out his role as a compassionate son of God. We know which one he chose. We know which one he could only choose every time. The question is, what do we choose? What do we choose in those situations when Jesus says, yeah, I know what your role is. Just be a decent human being. You know, it's easy to compartmentalize our lives. We see it all the time. We see it in society all the time. We know about state decisions in our society, government decisions about war and various life and death situations. We know the decisions they make, the decisions between the official role of being whatever we are, you know, as a government official, and, and, and compassion, and very often we know compassion does not win out. We know about arguments about how to deal with the poor in our society. We know that there's two sides. The official institutional role, how do we preserve the institution and keep it at its best, and what about compassion? We know these arguments. We play them out all the time in our life together in the community and in the nation and across the world. I, we were watching in the television just this week, we were watching Syrian refugees trekking across Europe going through Hungary, trying to get to Austria, to try to get to Germany, and they're walking through all kinds of weather, and they're struggling, and they got little children with them, and you want to say, my God, why doesn't somebody just, just change the rules and take care of these people right now? That struggle between who we are as a society and as an, as an institution and who we are as the compassionate people of God. And yes, it is a struggle, and we all play it out. In my role here in the church, I often play it out. It frequently occurs that someone comes to my office, it just happened this week, or calls me on the phone, and I don't know that person, they're not a member of the church, but the person is in need and presents to me what the need is. We don't give people cash, but we will help people because we have a deacon's fund that's dedicated to those kinds of needs. But even though we have a deacon's fund and I can access resources to help them through their crisis, I am always put in the official role of the pastor of this church who has to be the custodian over the funds that are made available to me by the deacons who receive their money from you. And I've got to play out that official role with the role of being the compassionate minister of the word of sacrament of Jesus Christ. And sometimes there can be real tension in that role, folks, because I get some really wild stories about why they need what they need. And then I got to decide whether or not I'm going to be a judge about whether or not their story is good enough for us to share money with them. And time and time and time and time again, I veto that option. I'm not going to be your judge and jury. You are Jesus at the doorstep, and if you're lying to me, that's between you and God, but I know what Jesus tells us we're supposed to do. Matthew 25, you can read back over the uh, prayer confession later. That's Matthew 25. Finally for me, finally for all of us is the church of Jesus Christ. It's the conviction that Jesus does not want us in the rabbi role. 
because he wasn't. He wants us. Always. Without excuse. In the role of a compassionate servant of God. It's not just a pastor in his office thing. We are all confronted with whether or not we will step out of our comfort zones, our traditional capacities, and into the language of that woman. Please feed the dogs under the table as well. And experience is that there is usually no return on that. We're not going to get something back except, of course, what Mark tells us is the best return of all. And that is your argument for compassion is better than the one I just made out of my official capacity as a human being. And thank you, the one who asks for help, thank you for reminding me that I'm a child of God. Amen. Let us